This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 22, for broadcast on the 15th of March, 2019. Coming up on Space Time. Breaking up is hard to do, especially if you're an asteroid. Magnetic bubbles on the lunar surface reveal evidence of sunburn. And antimatter gravity experiments move a step closer to fruition. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. That old Hollywood notion of Bruce Willis rocketing into space to blow up a giant asteroid in a collision course with the Earth is unlikely to ever reach fruition. Well, we knew that before, but uh, now there's some new evidence making it even more unlikely to ever happen. It follows studies showing that some asteroids are a lot harder than previously thought. The new computer modelling reported in the journal Icarus found that some asteroids are far stronger than scientists had previously thought, and so consequently would require far more energy in order to be completely shattered. The findings will not only aid astronomers studying asteroid impact and deflection, but it will also increase science's understanding of solar system formation and the development of more effective asteroid mining strategies. Researchers understand physical materials like rocks at laboratory scales, usually about the size of a human fist, but it's far more difficult to translate that into something the size of a city. Back in the early 2000s, astronomers created a computer model in which they inputted various factors such as mass, temperature and material brittleness, and then simulated what would happen when an asteroid around a kilometre in diameter slammed head-on into a 25 kilometre diameter asteroid at a target impact velocity of around 5 kilometres per second. Their results suggested that the target asteroid would be completely destroyed by the impact. The problem is some new studies by astronomers at the University of Maryland have entered the same sort of scenario into a new computer model which accounts for the far more detailed smaller scale processes that occurred during an asteroid collision. The previous models didn't properly account for the limited speeds at which cracks propagate in asteroids. So this new study provided a new insight into the amount of energy needed to actually destroy an asteroid and break it into little pieces. The simulation was split into two phases. There was a short timescale fragmentation phase and a long timescale gravitational reaccumulation phase. The first phase considered the processes which were occurring in the fractions of a second immediately as soon as the asteroids collided. The second, longer timescale phase considered the effects of gravity on the pieces flying off the asteroid surface after the impact and the gravitational reaccumulation that occurred many hours after impact. In the first phase, after the asteroid was hit, millions of cracks formed and rippled through the asteroid, parts of the asteroid flowed like sand, and a crater was formed. This phase of the model examined individual cracks and predicted overall patterns of how these cracks would propagate. Unlike earlier models, the new work showed the entire asteroid isn't broken up by the impact. Instead, the impacted asteroid had a large damaged core, which then exerted a strong gravitational pull on the fragments in the second phase of the simulation. This means the impact doesn't simply result in a giant rubble pile of weak fragments loosely bound together by gravity after the collision. Instead, the impacted asteroid retained significant strength because it hadn't been cracked completely. That means more energy would be needed in order to completely destroy the asteroid. The findings will provide guidance for astronomers trying to save the Earth from future asteroid impacts by telling them if it's better to break an asteroid into small pieces or try nudging it off into a different direction. And if it's the latter, how much force is needed to nudge it away without causing it to break up? It's only a matter of time before these questions go from being purely academic to defining Earth's response to what will be a major asteroid impact threat. You see, it's not a question of if an asteroid impacts the Earth, but when. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Every object, planet or person travelling through space has to contend with our sun's damaging radiation. All objects travelling through space need to contend with this hazard, and that includes celestial bodies like planets and moons. Even Earth's moon appears to have the scars to prove it. New NASA research suggests that some of the coloration seen on the lunar surface might actually be a form of sunburn. The findings are based on data from NASA's Artemis mission. 
Artemis stands for acceleration, reconnection, turbulence and electrodynamics of the Moon's interaction with the Sun. The new data suggest how the solar wind and the Moon's crustal magnetic fields work together to give the Moon a distinctive pattern of darker and lighter swirls. NASA Goddard research scientist Andrew Pope says the leading hypothesis is that magnetic fields on the Moon are blocking some portion of the solar wind from reaching the lunar surface. The solar wind is the Sun's continuous outflow of plasma and radiation permeating the inner solar system. Earth's magnetic field helps protect life on Earth from its worst effects. However, the magnetic field on the Moon is far weaker, forming only small localised bubbles of protection. In these spots, the Sun's particles can be reflected back into the solar wind or funnelled into nearby regions. The shielded areas under the magnetic field form pale swirls. Those bordering parts become darker, and the contrast is so prominent you can actually see it from Earth. In a way, these lunar magnetic fields in some regions are acting locally like magnetic sunscreen. It's like putting sunscreen on before going for a surf and missing a tiny bit of skin, which then ends up becoming bright red. Pope says that in some ways is analogous to a region of the Moon that's getting extra exposed. Unfortunately, the Moon's patches of magnetic field are not robust enough to completely protect astronauts from the Sun's radiation. But further studies of the lunar magnetic field, such as those now being undertaken by Israel's Genesis lunar lander, which is on its way to the Moon, could lay the groundwork for future innovations. Pope says it might be possible to one day produce a strong artificial magnetic field, which could act as a kind of shield. But of course, that's a question which is yet to be answered. The crustal magnetic fields now existing on the Moon and the lunar swirls might provide clues that astronomers can learn from. To find out more, Andrew Dungley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. Now, Fred, we're going to talk about sunburn, something that uh, a lot of people in Australia suffer from, especially the Caucasians amongst us, because, uh, let's face it, we're not built for this environment and we have one of the highest rates of skin cancer uh, of anywhere in the world. Uh, and at my age, I'm starting to show signs of it because when I was a kid, you just didn't wear sunscreen. You, that wasn't cool. Now it is. And mm -hmm. we suffer vitamin D deficiency instead. Uh, something the sun um, has provided for us. Uh, but um, what we're talking about now, which is a really elongated way, again, of getting into the story, is that the moon is sunburnt. Well, that's the story, really. <laughs> mm. So uh, why is the moon sunburnt? Because... The sun actually deposits not just ultraviolet radiation on the moon, which is, of course, what causes sunburn on Caucasian skins. It also deposits subatomic particles because you remember the solar wind is rich in electrons and protons and they are constantly streaming towards the, well, the environment, the, the, the solar system environment, which is occupied by the likes of the Earth and the moon. Now, the Earth, of course, is protected from direct blasts of radiation by its own magnetic field. And that's what sort of steers the atomic particles largely away from the surface. They funnel down into the poles of the Earth, the magnetic poles, which is why we see aurora near the poles. Yeah. But on the Moon, there is, no, there is no magnetic field to speak of, certainly not a global magnetic field like the Earth has. And so these subatomic particles simply hit the deck. They land on the surface of the Moon, and over time, they change its texture. In fact, they discolour it. They turn it a rather darker shade of browny grey, which is the, the natural colour of the moon. So we've known that for many years, but what we've only recently understood, and it's thanks to a spacecraft by the name of Artemis or Artemis, which is, <laughs> the acronym is appalling, really. Yeah, a shocker. Reconnection, turbulence and electrodynamics of the moon's interaction with the sun. Okay. <clears throat> it's, you know, somebody really deserves an award for that acronym, I think, because it sounds great when you say the word, but when you spell out the, the meaning, it gets a bit laboured. Anyway. And that's uh, never happened before in astronomy, or space <laughs> exploration. No, no, that's right. Well, I've, I've been responsible for one or two uh, <laughs> acronyms myself, which are all going to a here. But Artemis has been placed in orbit around the moon quite some time ago. It uh, was originally part of a mission that involved a constellation of five satellites in orbit around the Earth, looking for energy releases 
that come actually from the Earth's magnetic field, its magnetosphere, things called substorms, which are basically the phenomena that actually go to enriching the aurora. So that was the original mission of what was then called Themis or Themis, uh, begun in February 2007. But then two of the five spacecraft were redirected into orbit around the moon. And one of them is Artemis. Why am I telling you all this? It's because they're equipped with very sensitive magnetometers, devices that can remotely locate magnetic fields. And in fact, that's where the story gets really interesting, because as we just said, the sun's effect on the moon has been to discolor it. It's changed its surface because of this bombardment with radiation. Mm. But a few places where there are kind of swirls of lighter stuff, really weird looking swirls, and they tend to be around mountains. And what Artemis has done is measured the magnetic field around those swirls. And it turns out that these mountains are magnetic. Oh. So if you've got a mountain with more of a magnetic field than the moon itself, than the moon's background, what it's going to do is tend to basically swivel the direction of these subatomic particles and maybe sweep them away so that what you get around the mountain is a clear zone. So the magnetic field effect of these mountains has been to steer away, as I said, steer away the subatomic particles. So they're not deposited on the moon's surface and it leaves the moon a lighter colour. And it, it gives that area a very, if I can put it this way, otherworldly look. Yes. There are sort of swirls of brightness rather than the sorts of uh, different colouring effects that you expect to see on the moon. And you can only see that through infrared? It would be enhanced with infrared, that's right. right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's very much the case that you use whatever means you've got at your disposal to see whatever results you're looking for, and infrared enhancement is certainly one. So I think that's a really quite remarkable result, and it's certainly one that I wasn't expecting to read. It never occurred to me that there might be regions of the moon's surface where local magnetic fields would actually sweep away the direction of the subatomic particles and give you this clarity. I suppose um, we shouldn't be surprised because we always seem to find unusual anomalies existing in various parts of uh, uh, the solar system and the universe uh, that previously were un unthought of, um, you know, like variables in the, in the gravity on Earth. I mean, yeah, they're, they're very minor, but they exist. It's not the same everywhere. Yes, that's right. You, you, you're quite right, and clearly you're much more uh, forward-thinking in these matters than I am. That's Andrew. because I write science fiction. <laughs> yeah, but I think you're right. Um, and, and I guess, you know, it's, it comes back to something that I remember being fixated on decades ago. When we look at galaxies and things like that, we see images, beautiful images of galaxies, but we're seeing them from often hundreds of millions and sometimes many billions of light years away. And what you don't see is the is the structure, the detailed structure of these things. And it's the same with any celestial object. When you get a distant view of it, you only see the, the global properties of whatever it is. And it's only when you really start looking closely, and for example, by putting spacecraft in orbit around the moon, that you see these anomalies and these details that really add to our understanding of the world of space and the objects that are in it. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Does antimatter fall down or up? It's a simple question, but it's one for which there's not yet been a confirmed answer. Now, physicists at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, have found a new way for making exotic positronium particles for antimatter gravity experiments that might one day help answer that question. And getting the answer to that question could one day help scientists understand why we live in a universe made up mostly of matter rather than antimatter. According to the standard model of particle physics, the foundation stone upon which science's current understanding of the universe is based, equal amounts of matter and antimatter were produced when the universe burst into existence 13.8 billion years ago in an event commonly called the Big Bang. As physics best understands it, there's almost no difference between matter and antimatter other than charge. The negatively charged antimatter counterpart to the positively charged proton is the antiproton, and the positively charged antimatter counterpart to the negatively charged electron is the positron. But when matter and antimatter come into contact with each other, an interesting thing happens. They annihilate each other 
resulting in the production of nothing but high-intensity gamma radiation. And all this begs the question, if equal amounts of matter and antimatter were produced in the Big Bang, why didn't the universe simply annihilate itself in a sudden flash of purple light as soon as it came into being? In fact, why do we live in a universe filled with matter rather than one filled with antimatter? You see, there's an abundance of evidence showing that the observable universe is made up almost exclusively of matter. When little bits of antimatter are created, they're annihilated almost immediately. And if there were any large pockets of antimatter, it too would annihilate as soon as it came into contact with nearby regular matter, in the process producing very high intensity gamma radiation. But this has never been observed. Therefore, figuring out how our universe ended up with an abundance of only matter remains one of the biggest open questions in particle physics research today. Understanding the properties of antimatter and how they differ from those of normal matter will help scientists better solve this riddle. But holding on to enough antimatter long enough to carry out experiments has always proven to be a major stumbling block. And that's where positronium comes in. Positronium is composed of a regular electron, which has a negative charge, and an antimatter electron called a positron, which has a positive charge. Positronium has been studied since the 1950s to understand bound states in quantum field theory. But the particles have also long been considered as one means of testing antimatter, especially basic questions such as whether antimatter falls at the same rate as normal matter in Earth's gravitational field, and whether it falls down or up. However, being composed of matter and antimatter means positronium's lifespan's extremely short, lasting just 142 nanoseconds, and that's far too short to perform any meaningful tests. Now, scientists with CERN's anti-hydrogen experiment Gravity Interferometry Spectroscopy, or Aegis collaboration, have developed a new method using lasers for making positronium particles that live longer. A report in the journal Physical Review A claims the CERN team can produce 80,000 positronium atoms every minute, which are capable of lasting 1,140 nanoseconds. Furthermore, these particles have qualities which are valuable in antimatter gravity experiments. They're virtually unaffected by disturbances such as electrical and magnetic fields, and they have known velocities of between 70 and 120 kilometers per second, which can be controlled with a high degree of precision. Mind you, it's not the first time scientists have produced a long-lived positronium source. But in the past, they've always been sensitive to electric and magnetic fields, which can influence the particle's velocity, and so needs to be factored in in any experiments being undertaken. The new work may well open some new windows. We'll keep you informed. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Drama has surrounded the first Soyuz launch for 2019, with the mission, which was carrying a new Egyptian surveillance satellite, almost failing to reach its intended orbit. The flight aboard a Soyuz 21B rocket blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan, carrying the new high-resolution EgyptSat-A surveillance satellite. However, the Soyuz upper stage suddenly shut down, leaving the payload some 57 kilometres below its intended target insertion orbit. The problem was eventually traced to simple human error. Apparently not enough oxidizer was loaded aboard for the flight. The launch had originally been scheduled for October the 18th from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome, 800 kilometers north of Moscow. If correct, it would be the second time that Moscow switched launch pads for a Soyuz mission, resulting in not enough fuel being loaded aboard the spacecraft for the flight. Whereas the last time that happened, the spacecraft ended up falling into the sea, at least this time mission managers were able to resolve the problem by firing the Frigate M upper stage tug longer than originally planned in order to bring the EgyptSat-A surveillance satellite closer to its target orbit. The spacecraft was eventually placed into a 650 km high sun synchronous near polar low Earth orbit. The 1,000-kilogram inertia-built EgyptSat-A carries a multispectral imaging payload and uses SPD-70 xeon-ion thrusters for orbital manoeuvres. The launch anomaly wasn't without its flow-on effects. Because the Soyuz 21B uses the same upper-stage engine as the Soyuz ST flown by Ariane Space for its commercial launches, the decision was taken to delay the first Ariane Space Soyuz launch for 2019 by a day in order to double-check all systems. That mission from the European Space Agency's crew spaceport in French Guiana successfully placed into orbit the first six of an initial constellation of 648 small internet delivery satellites, plus orbital spares, 
for internet service provider OneWeb. Dusk here at the Guiana Space Center for a very special launch. It's the birth of a brand new constellation of satellites, and they are called OneWeb. Their mission to connect everybody in the world to high-speed broadband, and our mission today is to launch the first six of those satellites onto their orbits in space. Right now, they're waiting inside the launcher on the pad, and they're flying on board a Soyuz launcher today. She's stands 47 meters tall. Now, we are going to go over to Stefan Israel because uh, Stefan is the CEO of Ariane Space. This is an exciting launch, isn't it? Can you tell us about the mission? Tonight, we are launching the first of a series of 21 launches for OneWeb. It's going to take us about one hour and 20 minutes to deliver all six of the satellites. Can you give us an idea what's going to happen during that time? So we have decided five hours ago to fuel the rocket, and now we are in the very final operations. At 6.37 we will lift off. The mission will last 1 hour and 22 minutes. We will first have the work of the three stage, the Soyuz during 9 minutes and after we will have the FRECAT, the upper stage which will work up to 1 hour and 22 minutes. We will have the first separation of two spacecraft after 1 hour and 3 minutes and then four additional spacecraft after 1 hour and 22 minutes. Stefan Israel, thank you very much indeed. Début de la séquence finale, lanceur. And he has just announced the final phase of the synchronized sequence uh, for the launch vehicle. So this means that the computers on the ground are running all the operations. We are go for launch. We're orbiting the first six satellites in the brand new OneWeb constellation built by the Airbus OneWeb Satellites joint venture. And we're flying on board the 21st Soyuz to launch from the Guiana Space Center. À tous de DDO. Attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Et décollage VS21, OneWeb F6. On attend son normal, la propulsion est conforme à l'attendu. And they are off. The first six OneWeb satellites have begun their journey, heading out north over the Atlantic towards the Caribbean. Those engines on board Soyuz are pushing hard against Earth's gravity. We're burning five engines at the moment. He's telling us that everything on board is going according to plan. And we've got five engines. We've got one on the main stage. We've got four on each one of those boosters. But it's the boosters that are doing all the work right now. Heading out across the skies here at the Guiana Space Center, out over the Atlantic Ocean. The boosters only burn for two minutes, but that's long enough for Soyuz to escape the pull of our planet. We're delivering 80% of our thrust right now. The... So they've burnt all their fuel. We don't need them anymore. And we are burning the main core stage, the block A. He's telling us that it's good stabilization after the uh, separation there of those boosters. Each of the six 200 kilogram spacecraft were inserted into a 1200 kilometer high polar orbit. The Airbus Defence and Spaceport satellites will operate in the KU band using a technique called progressive pitch, in which the satellites are slightly angled so as to avoid interference with KU satellites above them in geostationary orbit. There will be at least another 21 web launches by Ariane Space, as well as 39 single-sat launches using Virgin Galactic's Plan U Launcher 1 two-stage rocket, which is designed to be air-launched at high altitude from the underbelly of a converted Boeing 747 carrier aircraft dubbed Cosmic Girl. OneWeb are also looking at an option to undertake further launches using the European Space Agency's new Ariane 6 booster, which is expected to start flying from 2021. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that total human carbon dioxide emissions could match those of Earth's last major greenhouse warming event in less than five generations. The new study finds humans are now pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a rate nine to ten times higher than what greenhouse gases were emitted during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, a global warming event that occurred roughly 56 million years ago and which was the warmest period on Earth since the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The results, reported in the journal Paleoceanography and Paleoclimatology, suggest that if carbon dioxide emissions continue to rise, the total amount of carbon dioxide injected in the atmosphere since humans started burning fossil fuels could equal that amount by as soon as 2059. 
Scientists often use this Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum as a benchmark against which to compare modern-day climate change. And while we know that people are to blame for climate change today, scientists still aren't sure what caused the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. But they know that during this event, massive quantities of carbon dioxide were released into Earth's atmosphere, rapidly spiking global temperatures by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. The evidence suggests that average global temperatures peaked by about 23 degrees Celsius, and that's only about 7 degrees higher than today's average. Commercial satellite images have identified new construction underway at the top-secret Tongchang-ri missile site on North Korea's northeast coastline. The new satellite imagery suggests that this new work began before the aborted summit in Hanoi between US President Donald Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The discovery is being described by Washington insiders as an affront to President Trump's strategy of diplomatic engagement with Pyongyang. Images from the specialised website 38 North and the Centre for Strategic International Studies show a new rail-mounted structure designed to transfer large missiles to the launch pad has been built. The observations also show a new rocket engine stand replacing an earlier smaller facility. All in all, the images suggest that North Korea is now moving to begin tests with a new larger, more powerful type of missile, one capable of transporting larger payloads over longer distances. The Tongchang-ri missile launch facility was last used to launch Unha-3 rockets carrying satellites into space. Those rockets were based on Russian and Chinese SCUD missile technology. The need for larger missiles could mean problems with efforts to miniaturize Pyongyang's recently developed thermonuclear warheads. If correct, you can expect to hear North Korea and their Iranian allies undertaking what they claim will be a new round of scientific satellite launches. In reality, little more than a cover to test the performance of the new missile. A new study warns that watching more than three and a half hours of television a day could affect your memory if you're over 50, making it harder to remember words and causing problems with language. The research, published in the journal Scientific Reports, investigated some 3,662 adults over the age of 50, measuring their TV watching habits in 2008 and 29, and then checking their memory six years later, in 2014 and 2015. They found a decline in verbal memory, that's the memory associated with words and language, in people who watched more than three and a half hours of TV a day. Luckily for us, there's no mention of a similar decline for those who listen to the radio. A new study has found that people with diabetes are more likely to experience back and neck pain, despite there being no evidence of any sort of link between the conditions. The research analysed eight previous studies and suggests that diabetes does coexist with back pain, but a direct causal link between diabetes and back pain could not be established. You can read the study in detail in the journal PLOS One. New research is warning that many modern laptop computers and an increasing number of desktop computers are far more vulnerable to hacking through common plug-in devices than previously thought. The findings given at the Network and Distributed Systems Security Symposium in San Diego shows that attackers can compromise an unattended machine in a matter of seconds through devices such as chargers, projectors and docking stations. Vulnerabilities were found in computers with Thunderbolt ports running Windows, Mac OS, Linux and FreeBSD. You see, computer peripherals such as network cards and graphics processing units have direct memory access or DMA, which allows them to bypass operating system security policies. DMA attacks abusing this access have been widely employed to take control of and extract sensitive data from targeted machines. Current systems feature input-output memory management units, which can protect against DMA attacks by restricting memory access to peripherals that perform legitimate functions and by only allowing access to non-sensitive regions of memory. However, the problem is this protection is frequently turned off in many systems, and the new research shows that even when the protection is enabled, it can still be compromised. Neanderthals are often depicted as having straight spines and poor posture. However, it seems these prehistoric humans were far more similar to modern-day Homo sapiens than many had assumed. New research reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences has found that Neanderthals in fact walked upright just like their modern human cousins. Scientists reached their conclusions thanks to a virtual reconstruction of the pelvis and spine of a very well-preserved Neanderthal skeleton found in France. An upright, well-balanced posture is one of the defining features of Homo sapiens. In contrast, the first reconstructions of Neanderthals, made in the early 20th century, always depicted them as only walking partially upright. 
There are growing concerns about an increase in GoFundMe sites financing bogus cancer cures. And it seems a lot of these so-called miracle cancer cures, which have no real scientific evidence supporting their claims, are now beginning to pop up in third world countries. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says people falling for these swindles aren't just throwing away their money, they're also missing out on real medical treatment, which could be helping them. Yeah, I mean, there's always been cases where people who are sort of looking after their kid who needs urgent medical attention, highly expensive medical attention, has gone to crowdfunding sites or whatever, please help me. And that's had a lot. The trouble is who you're sending the kid to. It generally concerns kids. There's a growing trend of a lot of people supplying services in third world countries, which are totally unsupported scientifically. Uh, a lot of them in Mexico, quite frankly, because they're just across the border from the US, but they don't have the same requirements to prove what they say they can do. So what's happening is that, especially in the UK, the Good Thinking Society there did a study of a lot of crowdfunding campaigns and found that some of them are raising you know, a lot of money, tens and tens of thousands of pounds, to send people to dodgy treatment. So therefore, it sounds like a good cause. It's a sad story of a kid who's suffering from serious debilitating disease. But where you're sending them to is not going to help her to waste of money. And in fact, often it increases the risk of death because those people are then missing out on real genuine medical treatment. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the, and some of the claims, I don't know if you know Holder Clark, who was a person who worked in Mexico, I think in Tijuana actually, though, just across the border from the US, so people could pop across in those days to get treatment. Very expensive treatment, designed to cure cancer, including in older people. She specifically said she could cure cancer in older people. The sad thing was she died of cancer. That's, that's the classic sort of story that people are sending these. Last resort. Um, I hate cures. to say that's almost poetic justice. Yeah, it is. I, know, I hate to say it too, but it's poetic justice. It's a sad story that people then... It's like psychic surgeons. People used to go to the Philippines, still do actually, to the Philippines to get their guts pulled out to cure tumours. It's nothing of the sort. It's just trickery. But people do it because they're desperate, understandable, they're desperate. And they then put off treatment that might help. And that's many, many cases. Someone who has put off proper treatment, treatment that works in favour of something weird. Classic case is Steve Jobs, right, the guy who founded Apple, who was suffering uh, I forget the actual condition he was suffering from. Pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer, yeah. Uh, pushed aside medicine that could have helped him, and it certainly could have been at the stage that he was at. Instead, he went for some very, very strange spiritual healing, and he, by the time he realised that that wasn't working, and he was sort of totally sort of drawn, and you could see what he looked like, it was too late. And so someone as famous as Steve Jobs has just thrown away the entire future for the sake of this natural therapy, which had no proven benefit at all. In fact, no actual benefit either. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.